from the culture of the American South, where roots hold stories, comes a natural deodorant inspired by generations of wisdom. Introducing Root Work, the all-natural foundational Black American-based deodorant infused with the magic of High John the Conqueror root. Our unique blend enriched with this legendary root offers 24-hour protection rooted in the power of nature. Embrace this deodorant that celebrates culture, history, and your well-being. Unlock the magic of root work today. Experience the pure essence of nature. Visit rootworkstyle.com and make the switch to a healthier cultural choice. What do it do? What is going on and what do it do? Ladies and gentlemen, we are in here, ready to do the late night tap in. How y'all doing this weekend? Hope you had a good weekend so far. Welcome everybody to the room. Glad you guys are in here. Hope you are planning to have a great weekend with you and your family. And I hope you've had a great week so far. Hope your jobs hadn't stressed you out so much. Hope you guys are being productive. Just doing a quick tap in, check in on the family. How's everybody doing to make sure you guys are good? Just want to do a little wellness check on everybody to make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. What's up, Afro Elite? What's up, D? What's up, Grinds? Um, still working on the movie. We're working hard on the movie microphone check right now. While we got the crowdfunding campaign going, we're working on the film diligently. And I got to thank everybody for participating in the crowdfunding. We got seven days to go. We're at 118. We're trying to get to 180. So we got seven days to get to 180. We can do that. Just got to get everybody involved and let's make it happen. So we can get history going. What's up, Nikki the God? Um, but a few things. Let me get some calls in a minute. Shout out to um, everybody at No Jumper. I did No Jumper again today. This time we had Adam in there. It was Whack, Whack 100. Shout out to Whack. And um, the Hebrew Israelite brother, Captain Tazariak, real good brother too. We had a real good conversation. We were chopping it up. And just bringing a different energy to that platform because you know that platform a lot of times has a lot of um a lot of ratchetness going on so the energy and shout out to whack whack wanted to you know bring in a different kind of energy so that the audience can see black men talking intelligently about some stuff so it's a great episode so it should be out in a week or so and um, we, we had some real good, respectful combo. Grown men talk. Oh, yeah. No, and, I, and I checked Adam on a couple of things. So, yeah, don't don't trip. Yeah, because Adam has said a few things. And I definitely hollered at him. So, y'all, you know, you, you guys are going to enjoy that episode. But the brother, Captain um, Tazariak, real solid brother. He's a Hebrew Israelite. And um, he was breaking some of that stuff down. Real bright brother, too, man. A lot of respect for that guy. Real, real solid dude. It was a real it was a real good pleasure chopping it up with that brother, man. And that's what I like, man. I like to be around brothers, man. Brothers and sisters who are just, they got a certain level of consciousness that they're trying to raise. And, you know, he brought some solid brothers with him. And I, I like that kind of energy. I like positive, constructive, intelligent folks where we can sit around and just chop it up and build. You dig? Everybody's building. And that's why, you know, I, I and I've been really, really thinking about us going back out there to D.C. to really build. Ever since I put the bug out that I'm thinking about it, a lot of people are hitting me up like, man, we need to do it. We need to do it. And again, I'm still thinking about it. I'm still thinking about it. Um, I do know what's needed. You know, we need to have a lot of us like-minded people just networking with each other, all getting on code, all being codified about our political agenda, our social agenda, our cultural agenda. 
Yeah, you did, because we'll always put all of these, I put these things in the context of culture. And when we show up to some certain places, my main objective is to get our culture intact, to celebrate our culture, because once the culture is celebrated and understood, everything else is going to fall into place. The political aspect, the economic aspect, once we understand what our culture is, because that's one of the key ingredients, the culture gets you codified. We got to be on code. Well, one thing that helps the code is the culture, understanding what your culture is. You see, so many people come to us, especially in the political realm, trying to dictate to us what our culture should be. They're always telling us what coalition we should be a part of and what group we should belong to. We, we're always getting named by different people. Well, you guys, black people, we're all a part of a minority coalition. That's an outside force telling us that. Well, you guys are part of a black and brown coalition. These are outsiders telling us this stuff. We didn't come up with that. That was brought to us, that whole black and brown and minority. And right now they're doing another thing because it's political season now. And we're seeing this a lot in Chicago. And I see this as a talking point that's being pushed down because I've heard it more than once. They keep trying to compare us to immigrants. They, they keep trying to make it seem like foundational black Americans who went to the, the North and went to Chicago are immigrants because we left the South for some jobs up in Chicago and New York and places like that. So we're immigrants too. No, that's a disrespectful ass narrative that we got to shut down immediately. I just saw a clip where they were talking in Chicago about all those migrants up there, those illegal immigrants up there. And they were giving some kind of speech and they kept trying to tie us in. And they were like, well, Chicago was, was founded by a Haitian immigrant, the Sable, and a lot of other people migrated up there for better opportunity. They immigrated from the South. They keep using that term. Man, we, we moved around our own country in order to take advantage of the economic opportunities that our tax dollars supported plus our tax dollars circulate all over this country. We're under the constitution of this country, meaning we should be able to move around freely in a country that not only we built, but we fought to gain citizenship for. So that's way different from a damn migrant group coming and leaving their government and joining a new constitution and, and, pledging allegiance to a whole new entity. That's that's totally different. We're not that. We're, I don't like being compared to that because we didn't flee. Bottom line, we didn't flee nowhere. We had to stand 10 toes down and fight for every right we got. We had to fight for the rights in the North. We didn't escape anything. Don't ever let no family, if y'all ever let anybody start talking that y'all immigrants too bullshit, shut that down. That's a major, major disrespect. We didn't flee. Don't compare me to no fleer and no disrespect to the non-FBA people in here. I'm not trying to diss y'all. I'm really not. But they know good and well, we're built different. We're, we're not, that's not us. We didn't do that. We didn't do that because we didn't go anywhere that was safer for us. Or we, we didn't go anywhere that somebody was protecting us. Who the hell was protecting us in the northern cities? Some of the biggest race riots happened in the northern cities. We had to go out here and put in work ourselves. Nobody protected us. And, and going back to that whole um, Chicago was founded by the Haitian immigrant thing. And, you know, uh, that narrative has been around for a long time. And, you know, I, I bought into it for a minute about hey, the um, uh, De Sable being a Haitian immigrant. To, and when we really look at that, tr truth be told, there's no definitive proof that he was actually Haitian. They just assumed that he was Haitian because his last name was French. But there were a lot of black people who had French surnames in St. Louis and Louis, um, in Louisiana, places like that. So they never, there's not really proof that he came from Haiti. You understand? There's not really proof, hardcore proof on that, but, but I digress. 
I digress. But but again, us understanding and us defining what our culture is is very, very important. It's very important for us to do that. Because, see, that's power. When we dictate what our culture is, we di- dictate what the code should be. We dictate what our political agenda is going to be. We dictate what our educational components are going to be. So this is why we, we've been getting on code as far as a lot of this stuff for a long time, for the last few years. And this is why they're so shook. This is why they had to come up with the whole critical race theory stuff to justify taking our history out of the school books and out of the schools because we are getting codified. So now they're trying to do counter moves to combat that. And we have to stay on our square about that. Um, by the way, they, um, they said that that killer, uh, that Robert card guy, whatever his name is, who massacred all those people. They said they found him. Um, they said they found him with a, a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So it took them, what, three days to find a dead guy? Are they that incompetent? Is that what they're trying to say? The guy was dead and they, they couldn't find a dead dude? You got all that manpower and the dude's just allegedly laying there and y'all couldn't find him? Y'all couldn't look at surveillance? See, the thing is, family, with this whole thing, I think that guy was being held by law enforcement. And I've talked about that before. I think the guy was held by law enforcement. Another thing, he wrote some kind of letter or some kind of manifesto. Notice they don't never release them joints no more. You notice they don't like releasing these dudes' manifestos now that will tell you exactly where they got their ideologies from, exactly who radicalized them. You see? They don't want to release that stuff no more. They keep it under wraps. That lets you know these are not lone wolves. These people are writing manifestos, letting folks know, hey, listen, I listen to Fox News, buddy. I, I, I love Tucker Carlson, man. I I love Candace Owens. I mean, remember uh, the New Zealand shooter? Y'all remember him? He wrote a manifesto, and because it was overseas, they went on and released it. They are like, damn that, let's get the sensationalized headlines. They released this manifesto. He was naming everybody. He, he named Candace. Oh, I love Candace Owens. He was naming all the white supremacists and the white supremacist sympathizers. Yeah. And he was throwing up the white supremacist hand signal. And so this guy out there in Maine, I'm pretty sure this, some of his manifesto is 4chan-ish. I'm pretty sure that he listens to the usual suspects to get radicalized. But see, they want to play games with these damn white supremacists. And that, that encourages more of them. The fact that they sit up here and, and coddle these dudes and give them excuses, that sets up the next serial killer or mass killer. That sets up the next one because when these sickos are out here getting radicalized on 4chan and all these other places, if they go out here and commit some kind of heinous act, there's not going to be too much of a negative stigma for them. See, one one thing that would discourage somebody from pulling off from pulling off an act like this is the stigma that's going to come behind it. The stigma is going to leave on your kids. Your kids are going to be targeted. Will your family be targeted? And these white supremacists, no hell, my family is not only not going to be targeted. The the media and the court system, they're going to be sympathetic to me. I know as a white supremacist, these people are going to say that I have mental illness, which is what they've been saying about this guy who um, shot all those people in Maine. They ran with the mental illness thing. So when you do that, that's that's babyfying. That's coddling these damn killers. That's setting up the next one because they're now, when you sit up and say that this guy was mentally unstable, what you're saying is that he wasn't really responsible for what he did. So we can be a little sympathetic for him. That's why a lot of these mass killers don't even go to trial. They they deem them mentally incapable for standing trial. But again, 
uh, it was a black special needs kid down in Florida he was in a special needs class and he put hands on one of his teachers because the teacher wouldn't give him a video game and now they got him in jail with a million dollars bond in Florida and they were like yep this nigga can he got good sense I don't give a damn if he was in a special class in a special needs class in court he got sense enough to go to trial just ass backwards it's not ass backwards. It's white supremacy. I won't even say ass backwards. That's white supremacy is doing what white supremacy do. You know, it's a system of double standards. And they know that. They know that it's a double standard. And they try to pretend that they don't know. That's what makes the system work. Them knowing that there is a double standard. And they benefit from the double standard. They get a psychological benefit. See, that's how you keep everybody on the white supremacist treadmill. Let them know in blatant terms, you will be treated better than that group. Even if you do worse, you'll still be treated better than that group. See, that's messaging that's being sent out there. That keeps everybody on the white supremacist code. That's why I don't nobody really want to buck the system. They benefit from that. They benefit from it. And they know that. There's a suspected white supremacist who, um, that MMA fighter, Jake Shields, he's a suspected white supremacist. He says a lot of real racist anti-black stuff. This dude, we're, we're rent free on this man's brain all the time. Jake Shields. He's a suspect. Not saying that he is a white supremacist, but many people suspect that he could be. But he's very vocal about a lot of anti-black racism that he seems to harbor. Now, this guy was in a fight with um, Tyron something. is an MMA fighter. is a black MMA fighter. And this guy, Jake Shields, hasn't fought too many black MMA, MMA fighters. But I know he fought Tyron something. I can't think of Tyron's last name. But Tyron was putting the brakes. On, and I, I'm, I hope I'm saying his first name right. But the black fighter was, was putting work on dude. But they went the distance. Nobody knocked the other out so they went the distance but the brother was handling this dude the brother was putting them things on him and at the end of the fight because they went the distance boom they gave it to the white boy they gave it to Jake now he he understands that he did he knew he didn't win that fight but he knows that his white privilege is there and if you go to distance with a, with a white supremacist in a system of white supremacy even if you win just going the distance they're going to let them win by default. I remember the Floyd Mayweather fight when he fought McGregor. Now, Floyd beat the brakes off McGregor. And I was up there in Vegas. You had these people, these suspected white supremacists running around acting like McGregor won simply because he kind of went somewhat of the distance with Floyd. Floyd didn't take him out in the first few rounds, so they went a few rounds before McGregor lost but just the fact that he kind of stayed in the fight for a few rounds they look at that as a win in white supremacist culture because they grade by a curve they know our innate talent they know the talent that we have they know that so they grade by a curve very interesting dynamic if you go the distance with the white supremacists, you're going to lose by default. You got to knock them out. If you don't knock them out, and I'm saying proverbially, all right, proverbially, I'm not, I'm not talking about literally, but in, in, in a boxing match, literally, if you don't knock them out, they're going to let them win by default. You know? So we got to understand the kind of system that we're in, ladies and gentlemen. All right, who we got in here? We got a lot of folks in here. Let's get some folks on the line. We got somebody in here called Hip Hop Purist. How pure of a hip hopper are you, ma'am? I see you down there. I see you, Hip Hop Purist. Wait, what did she got the hell out of it? When I said that, Hip Hop Purist got up out of here real fast. Uh-oh. When I said that, that person bounced. Uh-oh. It must have been a dude catfishing. Y'all, y'all dudes need to stop that. And you know who does that? Who These dudes be pretending to be women online or they have a, a woman's profile. Y'all tethers be doing that. Y'all really got to stop that. 
All right, hold on. Let's get hip hop. Miss Miss Hip Hop Purist came back. Hip Hop Purist, hop on. Let's see if you're a dude or not. Don't do me, Tariq. I okay. am not a dude. I okay. am not a dude. Hello. Yeah. I'm just double checking. I'm, I'm double checking. I don't know if you were a tether over there trying to get some some catfish money out of niggas. No, I'm not. Now, what kind of hip hop purist do you? <laughs> what do you mean? What kind? The opposite okay. kind. I just okay. I rock the real music. Okay. Well, you, know, uh, you say hip hop purist. I mean, is it modern hip hop? What the um, little bow wow? No, who, who the fuck you, to? you know where this came from? This is a a playoff of a while ago, a couple years ago, when um the Drake interview. It was like the interview with LeBron. He had released it, and he was talking about how. He was categorizing like people who were hating on him as hip hop purists. And so <laughs> I kind of took the day, but I ran with it. It wasn't even like on no hating on Drake. It just, you know, like I listen to a lot of music critiquing and a lot of the newer artists nowadays, they can't really take that critique. So that's why I just kind of ran right. with it. Okay. What city are you in, dear? Where were you living? So I am from Chicago, but I live in Cali and Long Beach. I've been out here for about eight, eight or nine years. Oh, cool, cool, cool. How you like California? I love it here. I love it here. I still miss home, but, you know, Cali's treating mm -hmm. me well, so. Good. Are you dating a Mexican down there in Long Beach? Jesus, why do everybody say that? <laughs> right, right, right. No, right. I'm not. <laughs> a lot of them down there, too. <laughs> All right, just ask you. I'm not. Yeah, a lot of the brothers that moved out. I yeah, know. A lot of the brothers that moved I do have to look so, far and uh, wide to find brothers, but um, no, I'm 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 for the black man. Mm -hmm. Good, there you go, there you go, dude. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, beloved. Thanks for talking. Mm -hmm. I had to ask. I had to ask. The you know, Long Beach has changed. I used to have a couple of honey dips out there in Long Beach. Some fine, some strong in the face. I've talked about that before. I had a strong face chick out in Long Beach a long time ago. Had a couple of dimes out there. A couple of baddies. Some bad 90s dimes. The 90s dimes hit different. The 90s women, man, let me tell you something. Them 90s dimes, the women from around 91 to 96... It was something different. Hit me. Oh, my wife done popped up. I'm on my thing. I'm on live right now. We're talking about uh, Christian values. Uh, but um, we'll talk about that later. Guys. Anyway, let me get some more calls in. <laughs> Hold on. All right, let's get... um. Let me see. Let's get conservative Chris in here. Conservative Chris. Well, yeah, conservative Chris, let's get the microphone on. Conservative Chris. What's going on? Can you hear me? Um, yes, I can hear you, conservative Chris. How are you? I'm doing good, and you? I'm good, brother. What is on your mind, sir? Okay, I was listening to you. I'm glad you were on. It was good entertainment. I just heard you uh, mention uh, white supremacy a few times, and I noticed that white yeah. people... Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing, yes. I okay. have said that. And I noticed that uh, white people don't really mention black supremacy too much. And I wanted to know, is, is white supremacy a real thing? Um, well, according to them, they're the ones who created the term and the concept and the ideology and the military protection of white supremacy. So, yes, it is a very real thing. You said black supremacy. Um, by definition, you can't have two supremes. So supreme, by definition, means end all, be all, the zenith, the pinnacle, none higher. Um, there cannot logically be black supremacy under a system of white supremacy, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're leading right into my point. Uh, is, is there any other uh, supremacy in the world besides white supremacy? If there is, name it. 
Oh no, I, I I don't believe that there is. Uh, but okay, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. No, the thing is, so by that logic, we would have to conclude that white people are superior. Is that is that correct? They're in a superior position, right? Of what? Of us. They have complete control over non-white people all over the planet. They are in a superior position, right? Well, well, what I've noticed in my perspective is that they don't really have, the people that they so-called have control over are the people that don't have control over themselves. So it's... Okay, okay. Let's, 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 let's through. Now, who has control over themselves and they're not controlled by the white supremacist? Uh, I, w- I would say first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, Jewish people. Um, you mean the ones that had a Holocaust? Uh, yeah, the ones that received reparations for the Holocaust. Right. But there was a Holocaust where white supremacists killed millions of them. Uh, that's what, what, white supremacy your, right there. It, but what's the point? I mean, it's, it's like it's like a a war. I mean, but they they obviously uh, came out all right after that. Their culture. Oh. I mean, they didn't. They weren't diminished as a people because of that. Um, that that kind of put a stain on them, and they had to make you know the they had to make right the government of um, Germany. They had to do the right thing because there was a world war. But yeah, they were dominated by the white supremacists to the point where the white supremacists killed millions of them and stigmatized them. That's the proof of white supremacy. No, right? I believe your I believe your question was a, a group of people that are not affected uh, by white supremacy, and if you meant by never having an encounter. Yeah, that that's one thing, but I don't believe that they're negatively affected. I don't believe that the Chinese man is negatively affected to a point where he's being uh where he's whining uh in regards to white people uh in the way that we do or even you mentioning the, the part, phrase white supremacy. You mean the part that um of you mean the China that was um, partially controlled by Britain and colonized by Britain for a minute? That China? Yeah, that eventually overcame that situation right. and is now is a is a formidable right. threat and a superpower. Right. And they got warships over there off the coast of China now, putting them in check, letting them know that y'all better not get out of line. That China? Yeah, but I mean... The, there's the white man. He is a warrior, right? We know that he has. He, the the point of what I'm attempting but, to but on, let's, back, let's ahead. back it up. Come on, you're talking okay. about people that's been colonized by white supremacy, and the Chinese they're dependent on the the white supremacist economic system. See, they they'll colonize you physically, and once they're done colonizing you physically, which they can still do, they'll flip it and make it seem like, well, you're independent now, but now we colonize you economically. So you're dependent upon the economic system that the white supremacists created. Well, they still dominate them. There was a saying in the United States that you don't have a Chinaman's chance in hell. That's how dominated they were. Now, the white supremacists will throw you a bone and and give you a little leeway and and kind of prop you up to do the bidding for them. So they'll prop up China so that China can do cheap labor for the U.S. and other Western powers. So they'll prop you up enough just enough so that you can do the cheap labor, but they're still under the system of white supremacy, right? Uh, I believe that they're in competition for global power, uh, and then they go through negative situations with a person that is uh, more competitive and successful than them in that endeavor at times. But no, I don't believe that they look at the white supremacy or speak about it or feel about it in the way that we as people do in America. Right. Right. And and that's why they get dominated the way they do to the point where they have to flee. That's why there's so many Asians who have to flee certain Asian countries. 
because they get dominated over there and they don't really want to face what the real issue is. And what happens is they end up identifying with their oppressors. See? Because on, on a base level. Oh, go ahead. Because, right, because white supremacy has done a psychological job on a lot of people. They've been destroyed by white supremacy psychologically, where they start trying to identify as being white. You see? So they. Yeah, been, I mean. Uh, oh. But we have. On haven't. a base level, on a base level, it's like they're fleeing, right? But in the art of war, they're assimilating. It just depends on how you look at it. And I definitely don't think that Chinese people are a fleeing people or a surrendering people. I believe, if anything, it's a possibility that they're assimilating and what you consider uh, it, it's called mirroring, right? So, yeah, there's another perspective to look at that, that in the that, quest for global that's, domination. That's a splaining way of fleeing brother that's a splaining way of fleeing that's trying to make fleeing sound somehow honorable <clears throat> you know there, there's nope. a there's a, you know sir there's a reason why there's a bunch of china towns over here they were fleeing a lot of them had to flee they were fleeing over here to the west coast majorly after we built the country for them to flee too and they were taking advantages of the opportunities that were fought for by foundational black Americans. They benefited from that, sir. And they're fleeing to Africa and Jamaica and all these other countries as well. They're just fleeing all across. Is this fleeing or is this colonization? Now, that's a part because of because colonization. They're colonizing well, some of these now. Yeah, it's just that our, our perspective as black people, we're too, we're too weak-minded in the sense that we, that we think that everybody's fleeing from the white man and and, and it's not well, they, like that and we we yeah, we're the they, most we're the we advocate white supremacy more than any other people on this planet how so we we talk about it constantly it's to a point where it's like if i question you about it you're like well no black supremacy can't exist with white supremacy it's like why why can't it it's like the mindset is already that's why we're in the situation we're in. We have we given them we have put them people on way too much on a pedestal, higher than they put themselves. I hardly hear even white people discuss white supremacy. I don't even hear them say that phrase. They don't say, we it, say it. They don't say it anymore because white supremacy is the law of the land. So you don't have to specify what's already normalized. But we have to say it to let people know exactly what it is. It's not a coincidence that certain situations all the time end up with the same circumstance based on race. It's not a coincidence that white supremacists mass shooters can go out here every other week and kill a bunch of people and the white media is going to be sympathetic towards them. Or if a black person um, takes something out of a store, all of a sudden the whole black community is the worst thing ever. There's a reason for that. It's called white supremacy. You understand? That's all it is, right? I mean, they, they don't have to say the N-word either. I mean, we, we take over that for them. They don't have to say white supremacy because we're out there preaching white supremacy. And at the at the end of the day, it's really not necessary. It's like if you really look at their situation, it seems like they're having difficulty maintaining their own uh, political uh, campaigns that they got going on or whatever ideology that they've been attempting to uh, to spread to everybody else. They're having a difficult time. This is now, a time for us to stop. Go what ahead. What difficult are they having, sir? What what difficult time are they having? I mean, you know, with their own political, Democratic, Republican, you know, left, right, you know, gay, straight, you know. They're, they're not having any difficulties, man. They're perfectly fine. All they're trying to do is maintain the power that they have. It's all about maintenance for them to keep the status quo. And you keep the status quo. Your whiteness is based on your proximity away from blackness. It's always judged by how bad black people are being treated. That's how whiteness is judged in the country. And if black people get an, just an inch, there's a problem that they have to go on alert and rectify by snatching those so-called gains away from us. 
That's been their whole play. That's correct or not correct, sir? Which one is it? I think if we have the luxury to sit on the internet and discuss our enemies uh-huh. and say whatever we want to say, I don't think that we're in such a, a bad situation to a point where we can consider them superiors or sir, even you know talk sir, like that. Sir, me and several people in this room right now, some of us have been visited by the FBI several times based on things we talk about. That's called superiority. I get visits by them every other damn month. If something happens with anybody black, they're coming over here asking me questions. Any black person with any kind of influence, when you start making difference, that's when you'll start getting the visits. If it's just a black person on a corner, a black person in a room, just kind of barking and talking crazy and yelling, F the cracker, let's go back to Africa. They like that. They like the 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 koofy wearing ultra hotep Negro that's babbling about um, going back to Africa and the cracker ain't shit. They love that because they know that nigga is not a threat. When we do what we're doing now, when we're talking intelligently and then we are organizing and we're organizing lots of money and we're organizing lots of people to show up by the thousands in certain places to get on code, that's the problem. That's why we got a whole bunch of ops in here. We got ops circling around us all the time. So yeah, the threat is there. We're the only person, well, we're the only group that has had a Cointelpro program placed on them in this country. No other group had a Cointelpro program. That's still active, by the way, where the federal government has made a memo saying we cannot have any black messiahs out here. We can't have any prominent black leadership leading black people. We have to infiltrate them at all cost. We have to stop the rise of a black person that other black people are going to listen to. No other group has had that, sir. And they put this on paper. This was something that they had written down in documents. So this was 50 years ago when they got caught. See, they didn't reveal that. They got caught with the Cointelpro papers. So just imagine what's out here now and the propaganda that they have now against us that we don't know about. It's all white supremacy, sir. And talking about it, that's how we replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. Shouldn't we replace the system of white supremacy, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean... I think we should change our situation. I don't think white supremacy exists. Okay, so what's our situation? Our situation is that we are terrified, most of us, of an invisible racist boogeyman that we can't see. Now, why are we... we, Okay, why are we so terrified because of that? What, What is it about us that makes us scared of a boogeyman that doesn't exist? most of our charismatic black leaders have convinced us to be. Okay. Then why are black people so susceptible to believing something that that's not true? If it's not true, why are so many black people believing it? Because if you talk to us with humor and rhythm, we, we fall for you. So black people are dumb. We like to, I, I, I believe that we like to be, entertained a little bit more than the average person and we like laughter and and dance okay, so that so gets why, our attention okay so you're saying that black people that's you, you, black people are dumb that's what you're saying if black people are dumb why are we so dumb that's that's an interesting way to put it I wouldn't like to say dumb, but Tariq, yeah, we definitely have a situation where we're not able to compete on a dominance level with the so-called white man on this and why, this country. Why, is, why not? We're not we're not equipped mentally. We I don't think we never will. I think we we black people seek more harmony. And we're not willing to go the extra lengths for what it would actually take to be in power. What would it take? 
uh, it would take a lot less being entertained. It would take a lot less I, dancing. That's why. That's say, why our enemy. That's why our enemy can't dance that well. I, I didn't say what it wouldn't take because you. That's a negative. It wouldn't take putting duck sauce on your nipples. It, it, there's a, a a gazillion wouldn'ts. I'm saying what would it take? What's the proactive thing? What would it take for us? To- we would have to uh, attempt as a whole, the majority of us, to submit under God or, or a different way of putting it, to, to behave civilized, the more civilized so, than we have been. Submit under God. So black people are some of the most religious people in the world. How's that working? We've changed. We are our, our people in the past have been, but this generation that we okay, okay. If the people in the past were very religious, why were they going through damn hell with white supremacy? Uh, I believe that they fought against white supremacy, so called white supremacy, and prevailed a lot more than this generation. They had a lot more uh, independence and businesses and the ability to make a uh, progressive change than we are now. We're kind of st- stuck on a treadmill, this generation. Mm. And what would get off, what would get us off that treadmill? Because the churches are still there. We're still godly people. So what are you saying? What, where are these godless black people? I don't know if the uh, churches on the corners quantify what I'm saying, maybe uh, that that's one thing, but you have to have intelligence within your, you know, your theology. So some of that stuff needs to be cleaned up. Um, so, but, so there's yeah, churches, but we're too dumb to understand God. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. What are you saying, sir? Yeah, I mean, because it says that still uh, got people perish for a lack of knowledge. I, I don't. But you want to say dumb? I mean, you're already saying the white people are superior. So, I mean, if you want to say we're dumb, too, yeah. Okay, yeah. Black people are dumber than the rest of the people on the planet. And that's the reason we've been in a situation that we can't get out of. That's why everybody else can get their reparations except us. That's why we can sit amongst each other and not build for hundreds of years. Yeah, I mean, is that the word dumb? I don't know. Maybe cursed? I I don't know what the word is. Now, who didn't build for hundreds of years? What do you mean we didn't build? We we had to. We're the only group that had to build and then rebuild and then rebuild over and over again because everything we built has been sabotaged by the white supremacist. So what didn't we and that, build? And that's the thing is that we, as a people, are so looking for like some type of friendship. If a people have you and they lynched your people and they've raped your people and they've stolen from you, they don't expect for you to, you expect them to think that you're, you're going to just build on their land and, and sit next to them and build an infrastructure and get strong after they've done all that to you? It's, it's one thing about white supremacy, but it's also another thing about common sense. And, oh, and we're unwanted. Oh, build it. So where are you going to build? What's not their land? Well, if we could, I know you're against Africa, but the other nations of the against. world are wait, pillaging wait. Africa. And, against? What, wait, what do you mean against? You know I'm against Africa. What, what does that mean? What do you mean I'm against Africa? Against Africa how? I mean, what is mentioned. Go what ahead. the fuck? Does, I'm sorry. I'm, what does that mean? I'm against Africa. What does that mean? I, that wasn't the totality of my sentence what i was saying is in the sense of having a partnership or not being alienated from the idea of doing business or going back and forth or even living there or migrating there me that's them they haven't invited us back over don't say i'm against africa i went to africa all over asking for dual citizenship they were like eh they weren't interested in that. Don't say, don't don't put the shit on me. I've been over there, sir. I've been all over there trying to get dual I mean, citizenship, but nobody was biting. They ain't trying to reach out to us for that. They're we not weren't invited us. here either, brother. We weren't invited here. 
We built this. You know, this is our homeland. This is what no, no, no. We didn't. We're this is our homeland. We built this. We built. We were given land. orders to do Dude. a job for a group of people. I mean, we we, we could say we built it. We did, but we were given orders, sir. Sir, we use we were given orders and we used our own ingenuity. We were coming up with our own ideologies and our own ingenuity to get this thing built. The white supremacists didn't do it. We can say they we got orders. They didn't do it, sir. They tried over and over again on their own and failed. They couldn't build this nation. So why didn't we have an America in Africa then if they couldn't if they couldn't build it? Is America more similar to English uh, architecture or is it more similar to African ar- architecture? Well, sir, I don't know what that has That's to do. That's a good with question, it. right? Not really. Because you're saying that our ingenuity they because were failing. Africa, Africa has been colonized and recolonized so many damn times within the last 500 years that's a moot question at this point africa has been colonized and remixed so many times and pillaged by so many different people and they just haven't had to the ability to start over and get things popping and they're still being colonized but we had an ethnogenesis we're a whole new ethnic group over here so if you want to talk about the african infrastructure you ask them but over here the culture of America was created by foundational black Americans. We created the culture of America. You understand? Yeah, I mean, yeah, just reiterating the point that the buildings and the architecture in America is similar to England, right? So either the slaves knew English architecture already or they were given orders to do things a specific way. Okay, that's just one point. And what culture did we create in, a, in America? Sir, the food, the music, the a lot of the bridges, a lot of the architecture we actually created here. A lot of the early architects were us. We were building these early homes. Sir, just the energy of this country, certain things within the household, there's 50,000 patents that we have as foundational black Americans. And this is when we were allowed to have patents because when we were enslaved, we couldn't even get patents and we were creating so much stuff. Then we've created so many things, um, things as far as the, the, the liquor industry, a lot of that comes out of what we did. A lot of the foods, a lot of the styles, a lot of the clothing, a lot of things that we've created here. The culture here is foundational black Americans. We're the, the, the soul of the culture. Right? Yes. We we definitely have scientists, we have inventors, we have great leaders. But when we talk about actual culture, even if we mention fashion, the fashion that we're wearing is we're wearing white people clothing in a certain way. And we could, we say that, well, that's our style, but we don't really manufacture the clothing or promote that as the most desired to attain. We don't, in our music, in our culture, we don't reflect on our own people's designer wear as the high end, right? We always reflect as our enemies as the higher end or the higher luxury item so our our music comes from our enemy and and jews that control it like i seen the the documentary huh well how 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 does our music come from the enemy how when i was thinking about go ahead i'm sorry because our music has always been a response against uh what the dominant society has done when we have the blues you know that was a response from what they were doing. We had to create our own thing. A lot of the gospel songs that we created, we didn't get from them. We were using messages in our gospel music. We were sending codes. You understand? It was an antithesis to what they were doing. Even with hip-hop culture, that was something that we were doing in spite of what the dominant white society was doing. In fact, what makes hip-hop culture what it is, is the black power element of it. 
You understand? It was anti-white supremacy by definition. So I don't know where you're getting this. We got this stuff from them. How? Because even with hip hop, you say like who started hip hop, and then the the Puerto Ricans can argue the blacks, right? And then the the Caribbeans can argue the Puerto Ricans. But at the same time, the person who's not saying anything, the person say, hey, the one that really created hip hop is the Jew, the one who sat and did the paperwork and actually trademarked it and distributed it and no, actually had legal binding to it. That's that's who invented hip hop. No. We're all employees of hip hop. Black people no. are the number one employee of the month for hip hop. But no, that, that's not. what we have going on. No, we don't. They don't control hip-hop. They control the record industry. The record industry isn't the totality of hip-hop. That ain't true. Well, everything you said was untrue. You can't patent hip-hop. You understand? They can't stop oh, being... Oh, you definitely can patent hip-hop. No, you can't. You can patent a record. You can patent the recording industry, but nothing is going to stop. If I want to have a hip-hop party right now in a park... I can get a microphone and tell 2,000 people to show up and let's get some rappers and that's hip-hop right there and nobody can control it. That's what hip-hop is. It moved to the record industry a decade after it was created, sir. You're talking about the record industry. Now, that's a whole different animal. But the record industry itself isn't hip-hop. That's not the totality of it. In fact, many people say that once the record industry got involved, hip-hop started going downhill. When we were controlling hip hop, it was in its pure form. That's why a lot of the people who started it for real, for real, that's why there's still legends today. The people who did it before it got on wax, these people can still go on tour and they go around and um, they get the same respect even to this day. Hip hop is our thing. It's anti-white supremacy. That's why they can't control hip hop. They can control the record industry, but they can't control the culture. Because we can morph and do different things. That's why we have um, rap battles. They don't control that. We can do certain things with hip hop that they can't control because that's our culture. But go ahead, sir. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely understand. You're looking at hip hop as a, a spiritual aspect of it, but I'm looking at it from a tangible aspect. I'm, because I'm from when a you. Aspect. From a, from a cultural aspect and a tangible aspect. Because look, if I say, hey, I want to have a hip-hop party at my house and I'm going to charge $50 for everybody to come in, bam, that's tangible. So we can do anything we want with hip-hop. That's our culture. But when we get into the record industry, that's a different animal. Now, other people control that. And that's why hip-hop is that you see on the radio and the hip-hop that you see in videos has nothing to do with what the real spirit of hip hop is. Yeah, I mean, you can say, hey, charge $50, but if you say, hey, come to my house, I have a rapper, uh, I'm charging $1,000 to get in, uh, they're not going to be interested in the spirit of hip hop un unless it's a rapper that the Jew has co signed, that has no. been distributed, that has no. been publicized. No, because, because hip hop sorry. doesn't exist really in real life without the media. Right, without the actual cinema and the, the videos and the that's a lie. That is not true. Sir, you have rap battles. There's brother Smack who does the Smack DVDs. That brother doesn't have a big media hand guiding him. And this brother has rap battles all the time that's jam-packed by word of mouth. That's the power of our culture. Black people, we know how to get things popping on the grassroots level. That's part of the foundation of Black American culture, getting things done in spite of the media. Sir, uh, a year or so ago, we had one of the largest reparations rallies in the country. We got zero media support, but it was still packed because we understand as foundational Black Americans, we depend on grassroots um, communications with each other, which we've always done. That grapevine, as they call it. See, that's how we as foundational Black Americans understand our culture. That's part of our culture. See, it goes back to culture. So we don't need them to... Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Now, now looking at your point, when you say when the brat battles and, and like people saying, oh, we're going to have a freestyle contest, what have you. Now, 
I'm going to concede on your point. I'm going to say that that is a part of our culture that America has used, right? But I do believe also that if we don't own it and if we don't have control over it, it's not really ours. It's the same thing as the Indians saying, hey, that's my land, or the Mexicans saying the California is our land. If you don't have control over it, it's not really yours. Mm-hmm. But I, I do concede to your point on that. Right. But the thing is that part of those things, that's our culture because that's something that we can engage in by us being on code and we don't need their permission because hip hop was set up by design to be an underground culture that was in spite of what the white supremacists were doing. We couldn't get on their radio. We couldn't get into the clubs they can they controlled. So, hey, they, we said nobody's stopping us from going out to the park with a microphone and two turntables and doing our thing. So it was a revolutionary act. Hip hop, that's why no other group can claim that they created it. They don't have a revolutionary mindset like that, especially fleers. Hip hop could not have been created by motherfuckers who fled. It had to be created by people who understood revolution. That's why hip hop started popping off right around the black power movement. We understood the revolutionary mindset countering white supremacy anything we do that counters white supremacy usually we're very successful at it but a lot of times we just kind of let it teeter out but white supremacy is there and when we start countering it that's when we start doing better and we make lasting impressions right yeah and the, yeah and the thing is though and the, even though it being our culture and it's something to be proud of it's like the people of power aren't really emulating that they're not they, the hip hop or whatever that is uh the the swag or what have you like our enemies or other people they only use that when they want to get loose or if they want to act slightly a little bit more ignorant then they'll throw on our music or they'll talk like us right <clears throat> no. so it's like hip hop isn't really helping us and it, no one really in power is using it sir um not only hip hop is something that they emulate and the white fashion industry they look to hip hop culture for their cues and for their fashion guides they do this now the versaces and the gucci's and all of them they study us the white corporate media they actually study us even with rock and roll which is ours that they took away they study us with jazz which is ours too and they well, finagled some of that they were studying us studying our language studying our style studying everything but in modern times they do look at us the corporate white media they have whole teams of people that they hire to sit around and study what black people are doing to see where the trends are going that's all they do is study us sir we are the culture it's foundational black americans see when you don't flee when you come from a lineage where you're not fleeing you start creating culture because you're staying on your square and when you stay put you can create more you're not running and fleeing all over the damn place you can kind of create something and we've created so much culture and so many styles and trends and influences that we are the heartbeat of this country. Foundational Black Americans are the lifeblood of this country. Are we in a situation where we're dominated by white supremacy? Yes, we are, but we acknowledge it. Other groups, they don't acknowledge that they've been dominated. They just flee and stay in denial and then try to get us to be in denial with them. And we can't do that because if we ain't fighting white supremacy, who's going to fight them? Then we're all done, right? And uh, I'm definitely listening to you. Right. Now, your family, I know you're you're biracial, dude, right? No, I'm not biracial, Terry. You, I, go ahead, though, man. This I could have you told me. I, I, no, I, I, I could have swore you told me you were biracial at one point. No, I said that my uh, family was a runaway slave from a long time ago, man. So, like, yeah, I have white blood in my family like anybody else. But it's not an immediate situation where I, that's like, oh, my first cousin is white or something. Now, where's your family from? Because I know uh, you... My immediate family... 
Huh? You you filibuster on that? I I, I can't remember, but I, I know you kind of right. You didn't you didn't you you're not definitive. Where's your where's your family? Yeah, I mean, I'm from I'm from Detroit, man, and like we don't really be d- discussing our business with everybody listening. This is a crazy okay, time. So, you know? I wouldn't okay, go but, into all my personal. I'm from that, Detroit, okay, that, though. Yeah, you're tethered. <laughs> no, I'm not a tether, man. What what, what is a tether anyway? A tether. No you come that. from an immigrant. You're coming. From, you come from an immigrant background, sir. No, that that's not the case, Tyree. Sir, you know that, sir. You come from an immigrant background. No, see, this is the time where for you to get your laughs and like. I'm not. I laughing. do appreciate the conversation, though. I'm not oh, laughing. It, I'm not laughing, sir. Foundational foundational black Americans are never ashamed of where they're from. If you ask a foundational black American where they're from, they're like, Oh, I don't like to tell my business. The fuck you know. Okay, so so where where are you from? Dude, uh, Detroit and Alabama and and my family's from North Carolina. So I say Detroit and Alabama. Literally I said Detroit and Alabama, and that wasn't good enough. I no, literally like, said the same thing you said. Dude, you sat here. I can't be telling all my business like that. That's what you said. No, because you said that I sounded a little standoffish. I don't know the wording you used, but you said I sounded like I wasn't too eager to say it. But it's dude. not out of shame or anything. I'm just not going to say, well, this was my address where I grew up or whatever, like just to prove something. But yeah, it was yeah. Detroit and Alabama, the same as you. I, huh? That's Tether. And, sir, you, I believe you come from an immigrant background. I don't even think you're being honest right now. Why? You, because talk- I have a different point of view? No, because you're talking like a tether. How, how am I talking like a tether? By so babbling and explaining and lying. This is what tethers do. That's what a tether is. And you sound no, like it's just that we just got to stop whining. I mean, I can't sit and talk, you know, black revolutionary all day. I've, you know, I've done that. But at the hey, same time, me, it's like we just got to stop whining so much, man. No, no. And we got to quit me, saying white supremacy. These people are not that, superior. That's tether We're talk. just. That's further tether talk. And also, the you fact know what? That, what's no, interesting no, no, is. No, no, because you're going to listen. You're not going to start babbling see fam this is a tether let me tell you something people who get offended by the term fleeing because you were offended by that which and we shouldn't say fleeing if they a foundational black american wouldn't get offended by that sir we we don't get offended by that we don't come from a fleeing background you're offended by that you're trying to explain tethers do that only tethers get offended by that sir Everything about you is tether, tether, tether. You see, you you think we don't know. See, that's a part of our culture. We we know. We know our own. We know. You understand? We yeah, know people I, from. You know, a- you know, you know, oh, I muted myself, but yeah, I, it's, no, I, it's I all good. You, but I think got to do the, the entertainment thing at this point, and it's a good segue to go to the next call. I all do right, appreciate thank- it. All right, there you go. All right. This is why we check tethers, because y'all are ashamed to say where you're from. And then you get around us and try to pretend that you're FBA and everything you say is anti-FBA. That's a tether. When you start asking people where they're from, I don't want to say all that. Now I'm uncomfortable with saying that. What the hell are you uncomfortable for? You don't don't bring your insecurities over here to us. These folks love bringing their insecurities over here to us. Let's get Christina in here. 